before I began, I want to tell you, I hadn't intended to come to this meeting because I was committed to two and a half weeks of meetings down in the southern part of the United States, North Carolina, Arkansas, Missouri. And I wasn't coming back till the 2nd of July, and this starts on the 3rd. I thought, oh, this human frame can just take so much. I'm sure I won't be in any state to, to come here. I'll be worn out. And I had my ticket arranged to return to Kelowna. I live in, in BC. It was all arranged and paid for. And a few days later, the Lord tapped me on the shoulder, or on the heart, I should say. And he said, I want you to be there. These are your people. What do you mean, Lord, these are my people? And he reminded me of how, for many, many years, my husband and I traversed this province in particular, from down Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, all the way up to Grand Prairie, Fort St. John, ministering to the people. And the most beautiful thing we found was that wherever we went to this nucleus of one and twos and threes, the Spirit was saying the same thing to them all. We didn't come and tell them some new revelation. They had been hearing it, but they were wondering, well, we're just such a few. I wonder if this is right. We would come to confirm to them what the Spirit of the Lord was saying to them. Hallelujah. So I am a confirmer to the body of Christ. And sometimes he does some strange thing to, in my life first, and it scares me spitless, and I don't want to tell anybody, because <laughs> I think, well, who am I? I'm just nobody. But he does it to confirm something to his body. So I am here as a confirmer. And the Lord, I said, well, Lord, um, I'm sure I don't know all those people that will be there. He said, it doesn't matter if you've seen their faces or not. They're your people. You have travailed for them. You have been a pioneer of the message of the kingdom of God in Canada. And how I have travailed. Two years ago, the Lord started to put travail on my friend Faith Williams and myself. We have travailed much that the word of the kingdom of God would come forth mightily throughout this whole land. And the last time, we weren't even praying, but Faith said to me, she said, oh, I wonder how long it's going to be before the kingdom of God um, comes into some kind of observation <laughs> in Canada. And we weren't praying. She just said that to me. And immediately the Spirit witnessed within and spoke these words to her. He said, my word shall run swiftly. Hallelujah. And so this is all I stand for, is the kingdom of God. And as for being in the land, I don't want to be in controversy with any other ministries or contradict them or anything. But it's like saying, if a person comes up to you and tells you, um, there's no baptism of the Holy Spirit. They needed that in the early church, but it's not for today. You can say, well, um, you're standing on the shore, I'm in the water, you tell me I'm not standing in water? <laughs> so if you're still in the wilderness and I'm in the promised land, walking up and down and checking it out and, and possessing every inch that my foot treads upon it, you're going to tell me there's no land? <laughs> I'm in it, I'm walking up and down in it. Oh, glory to God. And about six weeks ago, the Lord spoke to my heart and said, it's time to teach my children about the Melchizedek priesthood. Well, that kind of blew me away. I said, well, Lord, you'll have to teach me about it because I don't know anything about it. <laughs> and whatever I know about the Melchizedek priesthood are two things. I know that it's for us. When we walk in the land, we're not to walk in the Levitical order of the operating after a carnal commandment any longer after the mind of man or the ordinances um, that we walk by, where we're to walk after the Spirit. I said, this I know, it's for us, but it seems so high and holy that I don't know how to, I don't, even, I don't know how to talk about it, I don't know how to enter into it. So if you teach me about it, Father, I'll be happy to share it with you people. Well, he taught me about this with a vengeance. <laughs> I have been sharing it wherever I, I have been. I had to ask the gals for some extra Kleenex because it's, a, it's really a heart Turker. And so this morning, this usually takes two sessions for me to share, but I'm going to have to slice the bacon fine here and uh, try to get it all into your heart at one time, the Lord giving me grace. So I'm going to share the Melchizedek priesthood from the book of Esther of all things, but it's full of it. Hallelujah. So if you want to follow along, I um, personally... I don't preach. I just tell stories. 
act one, act two, act three, and I play all the characters. You know, I'm not into what they do in Hollywood. I'm not into the latest video or the latest movie, but somehow, sometimes things are so much in the media that it even comes to my ears, it bounces off, but I, I just hear it. And I heard the, that uh, the movie Lion King this year won six awards. It just blew away all the other movies. I thought, well, that's kind of nice as far as I'm concerned. It was a kid's picture, although people said, oh, it's powerful. It's got quite a message. And I told you, I'm telling you this for a reason. Because when we get into Esther, in the very first verse, scene one, the palace, the king. And the king is named Ahasuerus. And he reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over 127 provinces. Would you believe Ahasuerus' name means lion king? Lion king. <laughs> and, that's a, and guess who's winning this year? All the awards. The Lion King. Hallelujah. So this sets uh, up this king, uh, and he's ruling over all these provinces. It's setting him up as a type and shadow of the Lord Jesus, the king over all. And so he's ruling in the throne at the palace of Shushan. And so we need to know where this king is ruling because we're supposed to be in the palace with him. And Shushan means... Purity of word and thought, a lily for its whiteness. This is the palace where we are to live and rule and reign, because that's where the Lion King rules and reigns in our heart. Are you hearing me? Are you able to follow this kind of teaching? Good, because that's where I'm going. Now, he's reigning over 127 provinces. And it didn't just say this once, it said it, three times, so it must be very important. And what 127 means is, we'll break it down, the 100 is completeness, a complete harvest. And 27 is perfection, and again, divine completeness. It comes from, it's always associated with three, three multiplied three times, three times three times three, is 27. So we have this 127 provinces speaking of the complete world and all its inhabitants. And so this Lion King represents the king of all the earth who gives life and restoration to all. This is scene one. This is where we start. Do you want to come with me? This is going to be great. <laughs> I think I should handle this. I've got three glasses of water, a box of Kleenex. I think I should be able to pull it off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they love me in America because I am so natural. I don't put on any airs. I never went to Bible school. I don't even know what that word homiletics means. Now, don't anybody tell me. <laughs> I'm just myself, a grandma telling stories. <laughs> a grandma who walks in the land, by the way. <laughs> okay, now we have the character introduced here, the king, the lion king. And so we need to know the time frame. So we'll have someone come on on the stage and tell us the time frame. It was in the third year of his reign. I'm sure you all know these years and days if you've been around Ray Knight. He's good at this. The third year of his reign, we could say the third day, the day in which we live. And what he did was he made a feast unto all his princes and servants. I like that. He wasn't uh, um, eliminating any person. There was no person too humble that couldn't come to the feast. The only re prerequisite was he didn't go out in the street and get them. They had to live in the palace. If they lived in the palace of the king, then they were eligible to come to the feast. Oh, glory to God. So for 180 days, for six months, he showed the riches of a glorious kingdom to them, and he showed the honor of his excellent majesty. Has he been showing you those things, my brethren? Has he been teaching you of the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty? If he hasn't, ask him to show you. It blows my mind. And most of all, it blows my heart. That my heart can hardly stand it to know of these things, of the glorious kingdom that he has prepared for us and that the Lion King has come within to reign and to bring us into that kingdom. 
So for 180 days, he showed these things unto those who were in the palace. And after that, he made a feast for another seven days. Well, you think they'd be tired of all this revelry and feasting? But we have 180 days and we have another seven days of the feast. I got this from Ray, bless his heart, he's good at this. It comes up to 187 days, and that's the day of atonement. And I said, Ray, where'd you get that? He said, well, from the beginning of the Hebrew year, it's day one of the month Abib. And when you add 187 days, you come right down to the day of atonement, that great day of the feast of tabernacles where all sin shall be completely subdued. And so all, great and small, who lived in the palace where the king was, they came. And the, the feast of the Day of Atonement was going to be held in the garden of the king's palace. Now, we are the garden in whom he dwells. So the feast is going to be held where? In Jerusalem. No. Um... Victoria, or maybe Edmonton, no, in your garden, <laughs> oh Father, hallelujah, in your garden, that's where the day of atonement and the feast of tabernacles is going to be kept, hallelujah, and I used to think this feast of tabernacles was something that's going to come on a 24 hour day, well suddenly I wake up and this day is going to be here and I'm entering into the feast of tabernacles, oh no. The Lord has been clarifying this to my understanding recently, and he reminded me of the time when he brought me out of the church system. And he said, Elaine, you heard the feast of trumpets and said, Saran, Saran, come out of her, my people, that you be not partaker of her plagues. And I came out. He said, that was the beginning of my leading you into tabernacles. And then in the early 1961, I was on the mission field, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I covenant with you this day to bring you into my rest. Well, that scared me spitless because I thought he just made covenants with Abraham and Isaac and the important guys like that. But who was I? Just a little housewife with all these kids to look after and the Indians, and I was nobody. And that really frightened me. But finally I said, after he said it three times, I said, Lord, I don't know what this word means at all. I don't know what the rest is. And I'm afraid of this word covenant. But whatever it means, Lord, I thank you for it and I ask you to do it. So he reminded me of that recently, and he said, from that point on, I've been teaching you to enter into my rest, and you've been learning to fast from your own ways. And then one thing after another, he showed me how that from the time he apprehended me from the church system and brought me out so that he could teach me by the Spirit, I have been entering into the Feast of Tabernacles. Hallelujah. It wasn't a 24-hour deal. It was a, a gradual ceasing from my own works, a ceasing from my own ways, and um, having a fast of my own ways, and all this. And then, when that brings you to a certain level of maturity, you know that you're walking in the land. It used to be I longed to put on the mind of Christ, and I would pray for hours to hear the word of the Lord and try not to have my own way, and um, it was difficult. And I tossed around like you probably do, is this me, or is this the Lord, or is this the devil? You know? And finally, after some years, it was like this. This was my mind. It used to be like I felt his mind was way up here, and it was hard to, to hear from him. But as I began to be more obedient and more yielded to him and not want my own ways, this is what happened. A few years ago, I found he would start interrupting me. I would perhaps be speaking a word or hearing a thought in my mind, and he would interrupt me, and he would correct me and tell me more perfectly what it was. So, whoa, I never knew that, that the Lord could do that. So he's interrupting me, and sometimes I don't understand something. He just sovereignly tells me what it is. I don't even have to feel spiritual. I don't have to be doing anything spiritual. He speaks more to me when I'm washing dishes at the sink than any other time. And so his mind is coming so close to ours. We're putting on that mind of Christ. That is coming into the land, my brethren. Now, it looks like I'm digressing, but I'm not. I'm just being obedient to the Lord. There's some things that need to be established, and I'll just say them as I go through. Okay. We're going to let the Lord come into his garden, we who are dwelling in the king's palace, in his place of ruling and reigning. And so in um, chapter 1 here, 
verse 6. It's describing the uh, beauty of the garden. And in the garden of the king's palace, which we are, there were white, green, and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver. Wow. Upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. Now, what does that mean inside of us? The hangings were of white, green, blue. Now, white speaks of the righteousness of Christ, which we have upon us. The blue speaks of that heavenly realm. And green is new life. And I want to tell you something. There was no green in the Levitical order. There was no green in the Aaronic priesthood at all. But here we're in the palace of the Lion King. <laughs> we're going to learn about Melchizedek. He said, I'm going to drape you with green now. You're not just going to have the righteousness of Christ, and you're not just going to have uh, that heavenly realm, but there's something new you're coming into. It's called new life. After I spoke this in North Carolina, Carolina, I just stepped out, and one man practically ran like a bolt from the back, and he stood up and he said, the Lord's been speaking to my heart three times very, very strongly. New life, new life, new life. The green is going to come into our garden. He's going to deck us with green with his new life. I tell you, it must be true and not up the road either because the very fact that I am 71 years of, of age and I have worked, I have been so busy staying up very late at night, non-stop ministry. People just didn't go home. Wall-to-wall -wall people, they just stay. And to think that I can come to a meeting like this and I still have my vitality, and I don't credit you to, to any vitamins. I took them, but I forgot to take them. So I don't credit it to anything, but I believe it's the resurrection power of the Lord. There's some green coming forth in my garden. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, glory to God. <laughs> Poor lady who drove me to um, Arkansas, was she said, Elaine, I'm embarrassed. I said, what do you mean you're embarrassed? She said, I'm just embarrassed that I'm so much younger than you and, and you're just outdoing me all the time. How oh, you can stay up so late and do all this. And she said, I, I'm just embarrassed. I said, just don't be embarrassed. Just get under the spout. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have the hangings of white and green and blue. Now, why were they not found in the Aaronic or the Levitical priesthood? This, this color green, how come it wasn't there? Be, by reason of death still being in effect in that priesthood, there was no green. There was no new life there because one died and replaced the other, one died and replaced the other. But there's coming a new priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Hallelujah. And he's hanging green in their hearts. And so were the hangings, um, where were these hangings put? So they surrounded the garden or they clothed the garden. They clothed us with his righteousness, with that heavenly realm, with his new life. Hallelujah. There's a witness of this in the Song of Solomon where the bride says, Behold, thou art fair, my beloved, yea, pleasant. Also, our bed is green. You ever see a green bed? That sounds kind of dippy, doesn't it? A green bed. Said our bed is green. What does that mean? I looked at this word bed and it means rest? Is he bringing you into a new life of walking in his rest? Uh, bad means completeness or perfection or our marriage union. Isn't that something? Our bed is green. It speaks of a marriage union, that marriage with our soul and spirit with Christ. And it also speaks of a couch with a canopy. And a canopy is a, a covering of green clothed upon with his life. Do you want a green bed? Yes, I want a green bed. <laughs> and then there were also, besides a bed of new life, there was also beds of gold and silver. Now, if we're lying in a bed of gold, gold speaks of the divine nature of Christ. We're beginning to rest in his nature. And I'm beginning to judge all things by the nature of Christ. If some come to me and tell me some new doctrine or uh, just some revelation they have, I weigh it beside the nature of Christ. And usually I'll agree, and sometimes I'll have to say, I'm sorry, but that doesn't sound 
like my father. It doesn't look like him at all. <laughs> and so I'll have to say I can't embrace that because that's my judge. I'm lying in the bed of his divine nature, learning his nature, resting in what he is. Hallelujah. And then the bed of silver, silver is redemption. So we're resting in our redemption. Isn't that wonderful? Oh, glory to God. And then we'll leave the trappings of the garden that he's done. I think you understand that now. And from uh, there, the Lord goes to serving the wine. Oh, I like this part. It's so good. <laughs> in verse 7, And they gave them to drink in vessels of gold. Drinking wine from vessels of gold? We are all here vessels of gold. He's working in us that divine nature, and he's going to pour from us the wine of the Spirit. Hallelujah. And he said, the, the vessels being diverse one from another, well, when I look upon each of your countenances, I see that's true. You're all diverse one from another, but the wine is going to come forth with some of your flavor, mixed with the flavor of Christ, and oh, is it going to be good. It's going to be all bubbly and, and just bring new life to all who receive it. Hallelujah. And so... They're golden vessels, and um, they were all different one from another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. I like this. The drinking was according to the law. None did compel. For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Now when you're pouring wine out of your golden vessel... Don't worry that you're different, that you're not like so-and-so. Be yourself. Let your flavor come through with the flavor of Christ because he loves that. And there's be no abundance and no lack of wine. But, you know, we are given instructions how to pour out this wine. And he said, um, everyone can have as much as you like, but no one is compelled to have more than they want. He said it's distributed according to the hand of the king. So when you are pouring out wine out of your golden vessel, don't choke anybody. Don't pour it down their throats until they are choked. On the other hand, don't be stingy with it. Give it out according to the hand of the king. There is an abundance, but just give them whatever they desire. No more. Don't compel. It says, uh, no one is compelled to have more. Watch them and just give them what they can handle, because many have been caused to stumble by people just grabbing them and pouring a bottle of wine down their neck. <laughs> we don't want to do that. So these are some instructions for the golden vessels that are going to be in that Melchizedek order. We need to know how to pour the wine. When my son comes to me, he's not really walking with the Lord, but he, he knows God. He'll ask me a little question, a very potent question, and I have to just answer as briefly as possible. He doesn't want a sermon. He just wants a little short answer. And so I just give him a little sip of wine. That's it. That's all he can take. <laughs> so we have to learn to do that. So this is the wine of the kingdom to be outpoured. Now, scene two. Enter Vashti, the queen. Vashti, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus, the Lion King. A feast for the women? What is this? The Feast of Tabernacles is going on, and the king is, is um, pouring forth his royal wine, and, and, and he's in his garden and decorating them. How come the queen is having a feast for the women? What does that mean? What does women represent in the scriptures? Women stands for the soul, the soulish realm. So the queen is off doing her thing, having her own meetings, and she's ministering in the soulish realm rather than the spirit realm. That's a feast for the women. <laughs> and she is in the royal house, in the holy place, but not in the holiest of all. And um, when they ask her to come and show forth her beauty at the king's command, she just, um, she's not obedient to that. She's not interested in what the king's doing. She doesn't want to come to the Feast of Tabernacles. Her heart has not been prepared. She has been too busy attending to the realm of the soul. And so she doesn't see any value in coming uh, to um, the king's feast. I've got my own thing going here, and it's wonderful. The Lord is really moving, and you just ought to come. And so 
She was not submissive to the king. She just said, I'm doing my own thing, thank you. And she didn't come to the feast. She did not respond to the king to come and show her beauty. She refused that. So it represents the churches, the church system in this age that, has not, that have not been submissive to the king to come to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. They said, thank you, we're having our own feast. And when the first reports of the um, Toronto blessing and the Pensacola blessing started coming to our ears and people were saying how wonderful this is, people falling out all over the place and all these manifestations, I said, Lord, what about this? Am I missing something? I want to be open, you know, to whatever you're doing. This is what he told me. There's the outer court, the temple. There's the inner court. Then there's the holiest of all. He said, I, he said, the rain that is pouring down now in this day is the harvest rain to bring the harvest, the corn, to its fullness. That's what this rain is all about. But he said, when I send rain, I sprinkle it on everybody. I don't just put it on this little portion. It goes all over the place. And so they're having their portion out there, and that's how it's manifesting, and that's okay. But he said, I don't even want you to look. Don't even look at what's going on in the outer court. It's nothing to do with you. Don't look at what's going on in the holy place there, in the soulish realm, in the realm of Pentecost or Charismatic. Don't even look. He said, I want you to keep your face and your eyes steadfast upon that place before the mercy seat. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. He said, you keep the eye on that veil because it's opening up for you and you're going in you're going to stand face to face before that mercy seat you're not only going to behold the mercy seat of God you're going to become it hallelujah you're going to become that which you see oh glory to God he said so just don't pay attention to that whatsoever it's all right let them do what they want glory be to God I'm seeing a lot of things I didn't intend to say but the Lord knows <laughs> and so on this seventh day, the Day of Atonement, 187 days into it here, the Queen has refused. Uh, this church system has refused to come into tabernacles, to come into the um, feast that the Lord has prepared. They're having their own feast. And so the seven chamberlains counsel the king and tell him to judge this matter. And these seven chamberlains, I believe, represent the sevenfold Spirit of God the fullness of God. And so the counsel given is that um, this church system that will not be submissive to the king to leave off celebrating that, those things of the soul, that she's going to be brought to judgment. And their advice was to uh, divorce the queen and to search for pure virgins. Pure virgins undefiled that have not been defiled with the system, who've just been having the Lord to be their beloved, and they have not sold themselves unto man. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And so Vashti was refused because she was having her own feast, and she was put away. And um, the king listened to his seven counselors who said there must be judgment here. Vashti has been a bad example. She has wronged the king and all the people. And the result of this would be contempt for the king's princes, and wrath would result from it. And so this royal command was that Vashti's estate, the church system, would be given to another. It is happening. It is being given to another. And they're all virgins. Hallelujah. <laughs> and so the king's word decrees that his word shall be obeyed by all. This is what he said. This is the king's decree. In every house, the man should rule. Hallelujah. In every house, the man, the spirit, should rule. Not the woman rule, not the soul ruling, but the spirit. And I don't stand before you this morning as a woman. I am not in the soulish realm. I am in the spirit. I'm standing before you as a man of God. Can you receive that? Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Just thought I should get that one straight before we go any further. <laughs> I'm treading on pretty... Um, Dangerous ground here, I think. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. So in every house, the man should rule. The spirit of the living God. And so Vashti, as Hagar in Abraham's time, was put away. He shall not uh, inherit with my son, Isaac. Hallelujah. 
So then a call went out to seek throughout the land for virgins undefiled by man. And so uh, they found a number of them, and they came, and they were to be prepared uh, by uh, Hege, the keeper of the women. And he is actually a type of the Holy Spirit here, because who is it that prepares us to come before the king? It's the Holy Spirit that does that. And so he gave each virgin as they came, the Holy Spirit gave them things for their purification. Have you had the Lord give you things for your purification? Oh, yes, you have. Oh, yes, you have. Some sooner, some later. Enter Mordecai, scene three. Mordecai, a ministry that understands God's timing and plan, and he cares for the bride. He is of the tribe of Benjamin, of that tribe that is of the son of the right hand. Hallelujah. That rules and reigns with his father. But the church says of Benjamin, he's the son of my sorrow. He isn't with me. He doesn't approve of me. Why did he leave me? He, we are the son of the sorrow for the church system. But this Mordecai is of Benjamin, the son of my right hand. And so then he calls his um, uncle's daughter, whom he has brought up. And of course, if, that's, if she's in his family, she's also of Benjamin, those that are added unto the Lord. So he brings his uncle's daughter, Esther, he has been mother and father unto her. And he brings her and uh, puts her in the place of a virgin that could have a possibility of being the queen. And when we look at Esther's life here, there is a little typology that's very interesting. It says she has no mother or father, no natural genealogy that she's brought up by her uncle. And uh, so she has some connection here as type and shadow of the order of Melchizedek that as after an endless life. I just throw that in. We will pursue that further later on. But the meaning of Esther is very significant. I can really relate to that. Esther means, I will be hidden. Sometimes we have felt really badly about being hidden. But he hides his virgins. He hides his holy priesthood. He doesn't let them be known till they come to what he has Them. And so uh, Mordecai charges Esther, he said, now I want you to keep silent as to who you are until God's appointed time. Don't tell them about your family or your lineage or, or anything. Don't even tell them you're related to me. And so we go among our brethren, and many of them never know us. It used to be so hard for me to be among my brethren, and they didn't know me. They didn't know where I was walking. They didn't understand me. And I couldn't tell them. I couldn't tell them who I was or where I was walking. I had to let them misunderstand my walk. I had to let it be so because the Lord said, don't reveal it until the appointed time. Does this get to anybody? Hallelujah. Okay. So now, uh, Higi was um, over her. Uh, he had custody of her and he gave her uh, things for protection, for uh, power, and uh, just... Um, speedily giving her things for purification. And she was, along with the other virgins, being prepared for 12 months before they could go in unto the king. Now this 12 is very significant. It means the government of God. So in other words, uh, whether this be 12 months, 12 years, or 20 years, or half a lifetime, you're not going in unto the king. Your preparation is not going to be fulfilled until such time as you come into the government of God when he is ruling and reigning, and self has left the throne. Self has desired to leave the throne and let Jesus rule in every aspect, not kind of saying, well, we'll share the throne, we'll be co-rulers. The Lord is having no co-rulers here whatsoever because he knows we just mess it up. He said, I am ruling or nobody's ruling. And so this is the thing that we see here in the preparation of the virgins of God for being that bride of Christ. There's 12 months of preparation until he brings you under that place where he's king and he's ruling upon his throne. And the first six months are pretty rough because we are given the oil of myrrh for our cleansing. And uh, in the scriptures it says they brought frankincense and myrrh to Jesus as a babe. And again, 
um, to anoint his body. So that was given as a gift to him several times in his life. Murr speaks of suffering and pain turned into compassion. And some people have come to me and complained. They said, you know, once I was apprehended of God for this higher calling, I thought, oh man, this is wonderful. I'm going to come into the Feast of Tabernacles and it's going to be great. But the first thing the Lord did was give me a big dose of myrrh. And I really don't appreciate it. I came into pain and, and suffering and misunderstanding and maligning. The whole ball of wax, I don't need to tell you. <laughs> That's okay. That means that uh, you were accepted as one of the virgins in preparation. And if they didn't give you any myrrh, you're not with it. You're not there. You're outside the palace. So take your myrrh with thankful heart because it's part of the process. So in that first six months with the bitterness and all the work of the myrrh, what it's doing is taking away the old, cleansing us from the old, those things that were of the traditions of men, of carnal commandments, that were not of the spirit. I remember one time pr protesting to the Lord about something he was putting his finger on. I was so embarrassed about it. I was so humiliated that, that it was there. And he said, Elaine, I'm just coming against your enemies and mine. Oh, okay. That, that sounds all right. I'd be happy to, to let it go. I had not ever looked at it like that. So that's what the myrrh is for, to deal with your enemies and his. And it doesn't, I'm not necessarily talking about devils here, I'm talking about mindsets, traditions, walls, you name it. Okay. So for six months we have the oil of myrrh doing its painful work. And after that, oh wow, now come these sweet odors and spices, the beautifying, the putting in of the new. Hallelujah. And if you come to that place, oh, it's an altogether lovely place. You can hardly believe that you've come there, that he's making you beautiful now. And you don't know that you're getting beautiful with his beauty, but people look upon you and they say, Oh, you're really something. I really see Christ in you. Oh, you're really growing. You think, Oh, well, maybe I am. Well, that's good news because I've been drinking that bitter uh, herbs for so long, I didn't know I was becoming beautiful. We're always the last to know. And we're not to tell anybody if we do know. <laughs> Okay. And so Jesus gathered spices in the wilderness of this world by ever yielding his will to God, by learning obedience to the things that he suffered. There's no other way. But the disciples, they, they couldn't comprehend the cross. They didn't know that unless he gathered his myrrh and spices that he had died in vain. They knew that he must drink his cup of wine, his wine cup. They knew that, but they didn't perceive when he was gathering spices. They couldn't tell that. And people don't recognize often when they are gathering spices because it's usually painful. Whenever they would go to get certain spices, sometimes they'd have to go to a tree and go through the thorns, uh, past the thorns of that tree to, to get these spices. And that was hurtful to their hands. Then when it came to frankincense, frankincense, I understand, is an herb that doesn't release its fragrance until it's put in the fire. And when they put the fire to it, the fragrance of the frankincense comes forth. And I pictured Jesus in the hall of Pilate. They're mocking him. They're putting on this royal robe and the thorns upon his head. And they're, they're saying, uh, and they blindfold him. They say, uh, prophesy, who hit you? And they sort of think, and he stands there. He could have called 10,000 legions of angels, but he did not. He did not. And in that magnificence of that man, Christ Jesus, standing for us, bearing all the abuse of his own creation that he had made, that he loved and, and longed after, bearing all the abuse at their hands. I have a mental picture of that place of Pilate's Hall being full of frankincense. That they could hardly see for this mist of frankincense because the Lord was in the fire. And it was coming, burning the frankincense of the fragrance of his spirit. And, and the place was full of this frankincense, of the fragrance. And we never would have known the beauty of his nature. We would never have smelled the frankincense upon him and the beautiful attributes of his person had he not suffered like he did for us. And I hear some people say to me, they say, well, Elaine, Jesus died on the cross and suffered, so I don't have to. I'm sorry. Jesus died on the cross and suffered, 
so that I can, so that I have the power to suffer and come through like he did unto total victory. All glory to God. Because by doing that, his spirit became divisible. So there wasn't just one man with the fullness of the spirit of God. His spirit became divisible so that it could be in each one of us and put us through the cross, put us through the preparation of the bride. Because unless someone, uh, even a child, unless they have um, responsibilities, disciplines, uh, child training, they won't amount to much. No, they won't. They'll just be spoiled brats. And the Lord knows that. So he doesn't bring up spoiled brats. He puts us through his training. Hallelujah. And so the day came when Esther had been there for her 12 months, and it was her turn to go in unto the Lion King to see if he would possibly choose her. And so they had a, a regulation, a little rule, that uh, whenever a prospective bride was to go in unto the king, that she could choose whatever she wanted to take. She could look at all those beautiful dresses and all the fragrances and perfumes, and she could choose exactly whatever she wanted in any aspect at all. What did Esther do? She had fasted from her own ways. She chose only what he guy, the Holy Spirit, gave her. She said, I won't choose. You choose because you know best. Are you doing that? Are you letting the overseer, the Holy Spirit, choose for you? Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. And so when she went into unto king, she not only obtained favor from the king, the word of the Lord says, she obtained favor from all. Hallelujah. <laughs> Even the world likes us now. <laughs> they were not too impressed with us before. We were too churchy. We didn't love them very much, but now they love us because our love is spilling all over them. We just can't help it. We're so full of it. And so she went to the king in the tenth month. And ten is the number of testing and proving. And we are in that stage going in unto the king in the seventh year of his reign, in this Sabbath day, in this Feast of Tabernacles. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. And so the king looked upon her and saw Jesus, saw the nature of Christ, saw the beauty of this one that had been prepared by all the things that she had suffered. And so she was crowned and given grace and favor and he loved her with his whole heart. And so he put on a feast for Esther, and um, it was given by the king. And so when he puts away the church systems and chooses the hidden virgins who have been obedient unto him, he's going to celebrate. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's going to celebrate. There's no soulish um, feast here. She's not giving any soulish feast. The king is giving a feast. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles where you'll dwell with me in fullness, not just the gift of this and a gift of that and a portion of the mind of Christ, but the fullness, all that Jesus had. He didn't operate in the gifts of the Spirit. He operated in the fullness of the sevenfold Spirit of God. Hallelujah. I'm not sure what scene this is. It could be scene four. Okay. The plot thickens, and there's some um, evil and malice working in the palace. Here come the bad guys. And so Mordecai, this uncle of Esther's, he's always watching over this bride that's being prepared. He's always watching over Esther. So he's around the palace a lot, and he's hearing. He's not saying much of anything to anybody, but he's certainly listening. And in his listening, he caught a whiff of something that was dangerous to the king's life. He heard two guards that were the guards of the king who were supposed to protect him. He heard that they were planning to assassinate the Lion King. And so he reported it. I don't think he went directly to the king, uh, but he reported it to some authority that would tell the king. And so it was, they were, these guards were apprehended and off with the head. But nothing was said or done for Mordecai. At this time, please turn the tape over for the conclusion of the message.